Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, Senate President Andy Biggs blocks a health insurance program for kids from low-income families and plans for an initiative to overhaul state campaign finance laws are suspended. The Journalists Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Jeremy Duda of the Arizona Capital Times, Bob Christie of the Associated Press, and Ben Giles, also of the Arizona Capital Times. A bill to restore a federally financed health insurance program for children from low-income families may have passed the House, but it's going nowhere fast in the Senate. Jeremy, why? Uh, basically two words, uh, Andy Biggs, the Senate president, not a fan of the uh, this long-running proposal to restore this program. It's a you know, federal health insurance program for kids who fall outside of the parameters of Medicaid, make a, whose families earn 138% to 200% of the federal poverty level. This got cut back in 2009, I believe, beginning of 2010. Saved, had about 50,000 kids on at the time, saved us about $10 million back in the depths of the budget crisis. Since that ended, there's been always been a push to bring it back, and it seemed like it was, had a lot of momentum this year. Passed the House, unanimous Democratic support, the majority of the Republicans, gets to the Senate. Senate President Biggs, you know, parks it, doesn't assign it to the committee, says he's not a fan of the program. Why, why, why? Uh, well, it's, it's Medicaid. It, you know, it is uh, Medicaid expansion. It is, uh, it is spending federal dollars that add to the federal deficit. Um, he's not a fan of that, and he's running <laughs> for Congress. And so, you know, if you have somebody running for Congress as a conservative who just allowed uh, Medicaid expansion to go through under his watch, it may not look so well. Um, and, and I don't know if the governor wants it or not. The governor has been very circumspect about, about how he feels about this. This has wide-ranging support because it doesn't cost the state anything for the first two years. It's, the federal government pays the whole freight for 30 to 50,000 children from poor working families to actually be able to go to the doctor, get health insurance. After that, maybe the federal funding will cut off and there will be some state costs. So we don't really know where the governor is. He says we want to be prudent, which kind of sounds like maybe he doesn't want it. <laughs> yeah, well, it sounds like he may not have to deal with it. I think the concern is for a lot of the Republican lawmakers, if in two years after <clears throat> the federal government is done paying for 100% of this program, what happens if they ask the state to kick in a little bit of money? And the message from supporters for this is, you can drop the program again. There is actually language in the bill to restore this that would allow the director of access to shut down the program if the federal government ever asked for one penny from the state. But the optics of that in two right. years, again, to drop tens of thousands of children off of an of a insurance program, I think there's concern about how that would look down the line. Sure, I think this is, I mean, this is very similar to what we saw a few years ago with the big Medicaid expansion debate where they said, well, you know, this will cost us less than we pay now, the feds will kick in pretty much all the money it costs, and then we've got this language, this circuit breaker, they called it, I believe, that it would cut it off, but there's an, acknowledge, an acknowledgement and a concern among some Republican lawmakers that even if you have this language to end it, there's going to be a lot of political pressure mm -hmm. to not do that, no matter what the oh, know, there's going to be a lot of noise, cost no the state, as we've seen for the yes. last six years, listening to debates over whether we should restore kids' care. Right, and this does this does is is not just the regular Medicaid population; these are kids. So you know, if you suddenly say, well, you know, we have a five hundred million dollar uh, budget uh, surplus right now. But we're not going to spend $10 million for, for some kids' health care. That'll be bad in two years. Back to Bob's point. You're running for Congress, okay? Uh, yes, you can say, I did not increase the federal debt or the federal expenditure by, by not allowing this program. We're talking 30,000 kids. Do you run on that? You run on what matters to your voters. And I think for Andy Biggs, this is a calculation that you know, he, he's running for Congress to chip away at federal <coughs> government. And, you know, this is an avenue for him to do that. This is something that he can say, I helped stop adding to the federal deficit. That is a message that resonates with a lot of his voters. And, of course, Andy Biggs isn't the last word on it. We, we don't really have a good pulse of where the rest of the Republicans are in the Senate. But if there's 16, they could resurrect this on the floor, and Andy Biggs can do it. And that's what we saw with Medicaid expansion, mm -hmm. where he refused to, to bring it onto the floor. And Carlisle Begay, who 
shifted from Republic or Democrat to Republican last year. It was one of the co-sponsors of this bill. Interesting. It's a big deal on the Navajo reservation to get this for working poor kids. We'll get to Carlisle Begay in a second here, but back to uh, Andy Biggs running for Congress. He's not alone running for Congress to succeed Max Salmon. Uh, not anymore, not anymore. We got uh, Representative Justin Olson, a, a lawmaker from Mesa, is the chairman of the House Appropriations Committee, announced uh, this week. This has been pretty expected for a while, but he'll be joining uh, Senator Biggs in the uh, 5th Congressional District race. And uh, there's been a lot of names thrown around who, uh, of who might get into this race. They've been dropping off steadily. Olson is the first one to emerge. So we will at least see a uh, contested primary. He here. says he's the alternative to the establishment pick, and I guess he's referring to Andy Biggs because everyone and their brother seems to be endorsing Andy Biggs. Right, right. And we have Andy Biggs, now a 14-year entrenched lawmaker at the Capitol. Um, he's been around for a long time. And, and Justin Olson is casting himself as more of like a, a working class candidate to <clears throat> draw attention to the fact that Andy Biggs won a, a lottery sweepstakes uh, decades ago. And he made statements alluding to the fact, us, Olson made statements alluding to the fact that, well, I've got to work, I've got to have a, a, a job on the side of this part-time legislature, I've got to feed my family. Um, that might be his message going forward that, uh, you know, I'm just this average Joe working my way down at the Capitol. I'd love to represent you in Congress, and I think I'd do a better job than this yeah. entrenched Republican. Politically, there's not a lot of difference between Andy Biggs and Justin Olson. I mean, they're both conservative Republicans. They're both small government. Uh, Olson is the appropriate chair. He's pushing to limit spending, doesn't want to, you know, get the state in the mess, you know, wants to keep the state out <laughs> of the mess if we have another recession by limiting how much spending increases. You know, President Biggs, who has tight control over the budget over the last few years, has done essentially the same thing. They're, they're you know, federal pushback. Um, but to say that Justin Olson is an insider is n not really true. I mean, he's been in the legislature for, for three terms now, four. He's been a lobbyist for years. Um, he worked for ATRA, the Arizona Tax Research Association, as a tax analyst, which is a big lobbyist. I mean, there are offices right next to the Capitol. And the, the implications with the position that these two are in at the Capitol, uh, as, as Bob said, he's the chair of the Appropriations Committee, Justin Olson, and Andy Biggs used to be the chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee and by all accounts is, is still controlling what goes on in that committee mm -hmm. despite the fact that he, he gave up the chairmanship. To watch those two go at it in budget debates <laughs> could be fun. Uh, very quickly, uh, he, he mentioned, Justin Olson did, that the current process of, of Matt Salmon basically anointing Andy Biggs almost uh, before he could even finish his own resignation, <laughs> uh, was, quote, turning off voters. Has he got a point there? I think you're seeing some of that. I mean, there's definitely kind of a clique in that district who's looking for an alternative to Biggs. I don't know if they're going to coalesce around Olson, but we saw kind of a similar statement in uh, someone put up a website today to draft Christine Jones, the perennial possible candidate for <clears throat> a lot of different things, and that there was a very similar statement in that about, uh, you know, not letting, you know, politicians, you know, handpick their own successors and letting the people decide, not go in with these career politicians. All right. The, the real, the the real question is, does Scott Smith get that, in? Former Mesa Mayor. I was going to, if he does, or Christine Jones, or a Scott Smith, okay. this type of a person, not quite as conservative as an Olson or a Biggs. Right. Does, does, does Olson and Biggs, is there a possibility they split that vote, and here comes on the inside track a, a Scott Smith or a Christine Jones? They very well could, especially if you have somebody with really high name ID in the district. Now, this, you know, which Scott Smith has, they did some polling a weekend, a couple weekends ago, where I know Senator Bob Worsley was considering getting in. His name was polled. Smith was polled. Other people were polled. And Worsley told me he polled really well in, in his city, but in Gilbert he was unknown, whereas Smith polled really high in Gilbert, too, and he's from Mesa. So, you know, I, I think, you know, Smith, it's Smith's candidates, you know, it's Smith's race to get into at this point. Uh, he told me he was considering it, but uh, the last few days, it's been kind of crickets. So. Yeah, and, and Olson's entering the race, I've been told, really makes it more attractive for Smith because, as you said, uh, Olson and Biggs would split that ideological yes. vote, whereas Smith, as you said, has the name ID across the district to cut through that and get to voters. All right, a campaign finance initiative uh, targeting, uh, well, the kind of a, a two-headed uh, beast here. One targets uh, <coughs> dark money. The other targets uh, primary voting, makes for an open primary. They, they were kind of mixing and matching. The whole thing suspended? Uh, yeah, you know, when they first announced this about six, seven weeks ago, they told us, you know, you check your watch, this is when the revolution begins. That revolution kind of hit, hit, ran into a wall the other day. Um, what happened was you have these two initiatives and they're trying, kind of joining forces to kind of piggyback off of each other's benefits. And this was all basically being funded, at least so far, by this group called, national group called Open Primaries, all funded by this you know, Texas businessman named John Arnold. Turns out, 
Arnold did not want his money going to an anti-dark money initiative. He just wanted the top two primary thing. This is their big cause. And he told him the money we, you know, $500,000 went from this group to each campaign. And he said, the money that went to this one, we want it back. So now that they can't run this joint thing, it's, you know, they've suspended all paid operations. They say they're looking for new donors. They need about $1.2 million for each campaign within the next, you know, 10 days to two weeks to really keep this going. After that, it might all just fall apart. Was it, did, didn't he know from the beginning where the money was going? Well, uh, the organizer, Terry Goddard and Paul Johnson, for both former Phoenix mayors, say, yeah, he, they, though their representative, the open primaries representative, the billionaire's representative, was in all the meetings. He knew that the whole plan was to fund these, you know, split the money they give us between these two campaigns. Uh, open primary says, no, not, that's not the way it happened. Um, as soon as we found out about it, we asked them to stop spending on the on the full disclosure part uh, of the can of the initiative process. So, you know, we have a dispute, and somewhere in the dispute, there's a there's truth, and whether we'll ever find out, don't know. Uh, rumors that the governor's office wasn't too happy about the dark money aspect of this uh, this two pronged attack, uh, and governor's office says no, no, we said nothing, but keep hearing this. Yeah, and there, there's been a lot of noise about that, and Jeremy was just asking the governor about that this morning, and, and he's been trying to uh, avoid the perception that, that maybe someone close to him, or, or maybe he himself, uh, went to this Texas billionaire, and, and maybe somebody put leverage on him to say, I, I think you should stop what you're doing, don't fund this dark money group. And that's the rumor going around. I mean, what, what uh, you know, Chuck Coughlin and Terry Goddard and Paul Johnson told us yesterday was that they'd talked to donors locally who said, we've heard from the governor's people, and they told us not to give any money to this thing. I don't, they, they didn't necessarily allege the same about this guy John Arnold in Texas. So, that, so that's kind of the big question here is how that all went sideways, because there are some conflicting accounts of yeah, what I mean, they knew about what this money was, was going to go towards. They had this big press conference, and I think all of us who attended, we walked away believing this guy from the National open primaries group had said this one million dollars will be split equally you know they said that's not the case you go back to the tape you listen to the question asked by a friend of the show Howie Fisher I believe and uh, he was responding to a different uh, pot of money that they were referring to and they say we never intended this money to go to that incidentally they sent the, the five hundred thousand dollar wire transfers they sent them both to the one campaign to the top two primary campaign neither wow. to the dark money one and then the top two sent it over to the other campaign that kind of bolsters their case possibly. it does and, the, and you know the, the governor is people are pushing back a little bit and saying you know really if if he wants to be reelected, you know he should get rid of dark money and because you know who who doesn't you know the only way you can defeat a sitting governor is is with a lot of dark money so which is I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah we're kind of yeah. Drif drifting off. Yeah, we are the, drifting uh, off. The Sorry. Higher tide here. Uh, <laughs> all this is happening, and then at the legislature, campaign, it's a Senate at least, passes this <clears throat> campaign finance overhaul. What's this about? Well, this is uh, Secretary of State Michelle Reagan's baby for the, the 2016 session. This is a, basically a total rewrite of uh, a section of uh, you know, the statutes covering campaign finance law. And a lot of this is very ho-hum, a lot of this is very procedural, most of it is stuff that is very uninteresting, but there were a couple of very interesting points in there, and probably the biggest one is that uh, this basically it, this potentially opens the door to a lot more dark money in Arizona. It says that uh, you know, the way we define political committee is that if you spend a certain amount of money and your primary purpose is to influence elections, your political committee, they don't define primary purpose. In this, they say, they don't define it, but they provide exemptions, one of which is if you're a federal nonprofit recognized by the IRS, no matter, you can't be considered a political committee, you can't be subject to disclosure, and so therefore, and that's where all this dark money is coming from, so even if you're spending all of your money in violating IRS rules, which they don't really right. enforce very well anyway, you cannot, this cannot be enforced against you in Arizona right. it, under this it, bill. It's a big problem. It's a big problem for, for the folks who think that, that we should have more disclosure. You know, this, this, this big river of, of anonymous spending came after the 2010 Supreme Court decision, Citizens United, where the, the Supreme Court said, yes, you can't stop this, this spending, but you can have disclosure. And now, you know, states like Arizona are flooded with the money, and there's pushback <laughs> as to whether there should be disclosure. Now, this is from Michelle Reagan's office, who ran, you know, in part on trying to craft laws that would have disclosure. And when she's, as soon as she's in office, that changed. So, do we know why that changed? You know, I don't know if she's ever directly addressed it. I mean, the, the speculation is well. What she says is that I've found that it's it's virtually it's virtually impossible to do this. It would impinge on free speech. Um, her election director certainly says 
that you know uh, requiring disclosure crimps and, and squashes free speech. Uh, so you know, I think I, that's where she's she's at now. I think we had her on the program not long after her election. She kind of basically said the same thing. There's only so much you can do this way. I'm going to try and go around this way. But boy, I, 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 I'm just not seeing it. Well, and, and the other interesting thing about this bill and those federal nonprofits is that the, secretaries of state, the Secretary of State's office is kind of washing their hands of, of even enforcing or, or overseeing this and leaving most of the enforcement up to the IRS, which the big complaint with the IRS in recent years is they don't do any enforcing. They don't go after and, and look into these nonprofit right. groups to see if there's anything funny going on. And if they do, they get attacked by Congress, as right. we saw a couple of years ago. So uh, the, another part of this bill that didn't pass because it required a supermajority <laughs> is, is a crackdown on what the Clean Elections Department, or the Clean Elections Commission can do. That needed a supermajority, and of course it passed out of there with only and Republican that, votes. that battle between Clean Elections and the Secretary of State's office will, uh, oh, that will, will go on. That will undoubtedly yeah. continue as yes. this bill moves through the process. Uh, <laughs> Carlisle Begay, we mentioned him earlier. He is now running for Congress, uh, Congressional District 1. Yeah, uh, surprise. The, the former Democrat is, is looking for greener pastures in D.C. He's going to run. Ag he could possibly run against a former Republican who's now a Democrat. <laughs> correct. <laughs> that would be a real fun general election, wouldn't it? But uh, <laughs> yeah, th th this isn't too much of a surprise. When when Carlisle Begay announced that he was switching from the Democrat to the Republican parties last fall, there was there was speculation that this was setting him up for a move to Congress at some point. In fact, you had folks like David Gowan, Ken Bennett. Paul Babu wondering, should I even go to the announcement of Carlisle Begay's party switch because is he going to be running against me in a couple of months? And, and at the time he insisted, no, I, I'd like to finish serving in the Senate and I'd like to run for re-election in my legislative district. But uh, he, he's claimed that the, this is an opportunity and a call from his constituents that he cannot ignore. Um, but it is hard to ignore the fact that he would have a really tough time winning re-election in a heavily Democratic Northern Arizona district. Has, has he got a chance? I, you know, here's the thing with the first district. It's, it's, it's got a, a strong Democratic majority. I mean, Ann Kirkpatrick won by seven or eight points in the last election. But the, the Republicans who've always run there are kind of flawed. And a good portion of the district is the Navajo Nation, which is leans heavily Democratic too. But here you have Carlisle Begay, who has the Republican conservative credentials um, to get the, the voters in Marana and you know, down in Pinal County, which and Eastern you know, mm -hmm. Springerville and Sholo. And then he's got the potential to draw big crowds in the Navajo Nation, too. He could be a real viable candidate in, that, in a general. Sure, in a general election, he would be, very, especially with the Navajo element, be very difficult to beat. The problem is going to be getting through that primary. You know, Democrats may have always kind of viewed him, even before he switched parties, as kind of a turncoat. But our conservative Republican primary voter is going to look at a guy who's been a Republican for four months and say, that's my candidate. All right. Are the conservative Republican voters in that district going to look at other candidates? Paul Babu's got his own uh, unique set of problems. <laughs> and now the Speaker of the House, David Gowan, is basically asking the Attorney General, please investigate me. What's that all about? Well, it was a, a move to preempt possibly other investigations into <clears throat> his travel around the state and, and his travel mostly around that congressional, congressional district that he wants to win, CD1. Um, as our, our own reporter, Hank Stevenson, has uncovered, there's a lot of questionable travel reimbursements that have been made. And, and shortly after Stevenson reported in January about that travel, there was about $12,000 that Gowan reimbursed to the state where he found that I was either traveling uh, somewhere that wasn't explicitly uh, government related or I was driving in a state fleet vehicle, not my own car, and I should have been reimbursed. And this has been hovering over his campaign. So by going to the attorney general, uh, it, it does give the appearance of I, I'm going to open my books to you, I'm going to let everything be uncovered, find what you will find, and, and it, but it does also hint a little bit of please exonerate me before this drags on in the campaign for too long. And he did use, I think he said you guys gave the false impression of all this. I, be, I believe he did. Now, if, 
I presume that David Gowan knows what's out there to find, and if he believes there's absolutely nothing, if he's completely clean, this could turn out to be a fairly savvy move. Because you know, his Republican opponents aren't really hitting him on this yet, but the aforementioned uh, Republican turned Democrat certainly is. So if there's nothing out there, and if he knows that he'll be exonerated by this, you know, it, could, it could, could be a pretty good move. He cuts all, he preempts, as Ben mentioned, an investigation, especially one filed by kind of a nemesis of a lot of folks at the Capitol, Tom Ryan, who's been telling us for you know, weeks and months that he's going to file a complaint. Now he can say, well, I didn't get investigated because this person filed a complaint. I got investigated because I asked to, you guys to look into my books. Well, and, and he says in his letter to the Attorney General, if you make a determination, that will be unassailable that I have done nothing wrong. Well, we all know politics around this table, and, and, and the voters know politics. There are a lot of things said in campaign ads that, that are iffy and it, this will not protect him from hard-hitting mm -hmm. attack ads in any campaign because the truth is that he had to pay back $12,000 that he that was questionable as to whether he should have gotten that money from the state in the first place. All right. We'll stop it right there. Fun to watch that proceed as well. Good to have you all here. Thanks for joining us Monday on Arizona Horizon. Time again for Southern Exposure, our look at issues from Tucson and other points south, and we'll discuss how music impacted those who served in the Vietnam War. That's Monday on Arizona Horizon. Tuesday, a new Arizona presidential poll from veteran pollster Bruce Merrill. Wednesday, how to build a more perfect American university. Thursday, the importance of the upcoming Arizona primary. And Friday, it's another edition of the Journalists Roundtable. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you.